This is Michael Woodward, and this is Season 2, Episode 67 of the Jumble Think Podcast. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Welcome to the Jumble Think Podcast, where we interview leading entrepreneurs, hear their stories of how they turn their ideas and dreams into reality, and learn how you can do it too. Our guest on today's episode is Grant Sabatier. More about Grant in a moment. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to encourage you, wherever you like to listen to podcasts, head on over and click that subscribe button. If you like listening on iTunes, all you have to do is go to jumblethink.com slash iTunes. And for Spotify, jumblethink.com slash Spotify, it'll take you right into the app where you can click subscribe and become part of the Jumblethink family. Now let's dive into today's episode. Hey there, welcome to the Jumblethink podcast. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host. We have an incredible episode lined up for you today. In a moment, we'll be joining the conversation with Grant Sabatier. Before we do that, I want to let you know about our good friends and the sponsor for today's episode. Today's episode is sponsored by Opportunity in China. Have you been looking for a way to change your career or social prospects? Do you see the world around you changing and you haven't quite figured out what path to take? Well, you're not alone in seeking opportunity. Visit opportunityinchina.com for access to scholarships to attend universities in China, or if you have a bachelor's degree already, opportunityinchina.com provides access to jobs in the educational sector all across China. Working in China is not only well-paid, but it will place you among one-fifth of the world's population. That will boost your social network, bring you more deeply into the story of globalization, and open doors you never knew existed. So seize your opportunity now. Visit their website for more information at opportunityinchina.com. By the way, they also have a killer podcast. You should go check it out. You can find it on YouTube and all of your favorite places to listen to podcasts. Again, just go on over to wherever you like to listen to podcasts and search for Opportunity in China. You'll get to learn about what they do and how it impacts both people in China and in the U.S. Now, today's episode, our guest is Grant Sabatier. He is the creator of Millennial Money, the author of Financial Freedom, A Proven Path to All the Money You Will Ever Need. He also has a couple podcasts, including Financial Freedom and Millennial Money Minutes with Matt Zubricki. Grant, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Yeah, excited to be here. Now, you, uh, I actually found out about you from one of those news sources. I was looking at uh, a roster of people to watch that are millennials that are doing amazing things and are movers and shakers, stumbled upon you, fell in love with your blog, uh, was just listening to your, uh, both your podcasts actually today, caught up on a couple of episodes, loving what you're creating. How would you define your journey of what you're doing right now? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I'm at an interesting point just in my own life and my own journey uh, because I have been financially independent now for the past about two and a half, three years. Money's actually taken on kind of a different uh, focus for me. And what I mean by that is, you know, I spent you know, my entire twenties trying to make as much money as possible. And one of the things that happened, uh, you know, as I got to financial independence and millennial money started growing was, you know, I started getting a lot of reader emails and, uh, just a lot of feedback, you know, that I'd helped, you know, people save more money and invest more money and really, you know, start taking their money life seriously. And one of the things is those emails actually meant more to me uh, and filled me with more joy than any dollar that I had ever made. And wow. it's interesting is, you know, I was never and never would have thought that I would become kind of a mission driven person. But one of the things I've truly entered a phase in my life where uh, I enjoy being a teacher and I'm mm. trying to explore uh, what it means to teach and do that in the best way that I can. And so, you know, I, I don't have to continue blogging to make money. I didn't have to write a book to make money, but I really wanted to, uh, you know, share these ideas that changed my life with as many people as possible. You know, a lot of people struggle with money when they really don't have to. And, you know, I think there's a lack of really high quality information out there. And one of the big reasons is that, 
you know, the finance industry just makes so much money kind of keeping people in the dark and keeping money confusing. And so, you know, big part of my mission is, is trying to make a lot of these ideas as clear and simple as possible and as accessible as possible. And so I've definitely entered into that mission driven phase of my life where it feels fun to be driven by something, uh, you know, l- larger than money. It's super, super, super cool. And I, I I hear what you're saying. So many people struggle with money. I know that uh, it is almost a taboo to talk about it in a lot of circles. It's like the dirty little secret that no one wants to talk about. And for you bringing that message to a new generation of responsibility and, and financials and understanding the freedom that you can have and, and really defining money as a freedom tool, not about uh, some get rich quick scheme or anything like that, but really bringing freedom is a, a, a unique pers- uh, perspective on it that you just don't hear enough. Tell us a little bit about your journey of what brought you to this place of finding your own financial freedom, your own financial independence. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good question. I am someone who's always kind of questioned the status quo. I'm always, and and really a lot of things in life, I'm like, you know, why and is there another way to do it? And, you know, I found myself at 24 back home at my parents after being laid off from my job. And, you know, I had no money and I was really starting, you know, my parents were both working. They were stressed out and everyone around me was stressed out about money. And I started to think, you know, could could there be a better way or is there a better way, uh, you know, to make money and just have a relationship with money that's not so, uh, you know, fraught and so stressful. And so I really started thinking, kind of philosophically about what is money um you know why do we feel about it the way we do why do we embed it with you know our emotions and our dreams and you know at its core money is is really just a human invention and uh it in and of itself as an abstract idea is you know you can really determine what you want to think about it and how you want to think about it. Uh, You don't have to kind of accept kind of the world's definition of what money is. And what I mean by that is, you know, we live in a world where success is, you know, we're sold this idea of success as more and more money or as more and more things. And, you know, we grow up believing that, you know, when we do make more money, we deserve to buy ourselves, you know, better cars or bigger houses. And, you know, a lot of the reasons we believe and a lot of things we believe about money are because of, you know, how we grew up and just, you know, what's in the world. But, you know, when you kind of strip that bare and you think about money really as a tool and as kind of a blank canvas, you know, you can actually really determine what it means, uh, you know, to you in your life. Sure. You need to be able to, uh, you know, put a roof over your head and pay for food, but, you know, a lot of people, you know, are able to, to meet their basic needs. And then after that, you need to, def- you know, figure out kind of what money is going to mean to you and how it's going to factor into your life. And for me, money really has always meant freedom. And mm-hmm. what I mean by that is just having options, having choices, you know, when you don't have to get up and work for money, you know, you can spend your time uh, in different ways. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's pros and cons to that, certainly, because a lot of people do define themselves by their job or by, you know, what they do to make money. But for me as a person, you know, I'm such a seeker. I'm such a, a questioner. You know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of a deeply spiritual person in the sense that, you know, I always want to kind of figure out and you know, seek things out in life. And I really needed more time to do that. And so, you know, once I started realizing like, Hey, money is something that, that I can think about it, what I want, and I don't have to kind of buy into this common definition. You know, that was a pretty huge shift for me. And then just in terms of making money, you know, once I realized like, hey, you know, it's actually never been easier in history to make more money. uh, And I started digging into just the different ways you can make money. You know, that in and of itself was incredibly empowering. For you, um, your your brand is called the Millennial uh, Money. And so how old are you? Yeah, so I'm 33. Okay. Um, and so I'm definitely on the second half of the millennials. So I'm the older, on the older side of millennials. I started the blog when I was 29. Okay. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely firmly in the, in the millennial generation. Very, very cool. 
there are so many things in entrepreneurship, and I know entrepreneurship is part of your story. It's part of the way that you help defining uh, how we relate to money is uh, partially how we, maybe it's a side hustle, maybe it's a true entrepreneurial journey where you're all in, but at whatever level you're creating those streams of revenue, we're going to get a lot more into that in segment two. But tell us for you how you kind of made your your transition to this freedom. What were the kind of businesses you were building? What were the kind of things that you uh, found helpful in finding that freedom for yourself? Yeah. Um, so a lot of the money I've made has been, you know, through digital means, okay. whether it's, you know, launching, I launched two different digital marketing agencies and, you know, there's many facets to that. Everything from SEO work to website building to, uh, you know, Facebook advertising to Google advertising to online lead generation, you know, everything that fits within digital marketing. I was, I was fortunate to get in quite early to, to that field, but with that being said, one of the things that I think was pretty instrumental to me was that I, I never believed that I needed to, you know, really kind of hone in and be a deep expert in one thing. Okay. I always wanted to learn about a lot of things. And I think that we've entered a time where the more diverse your skill set is, the more money you're able to make and you're going to be able to make in the future. And I really took that to heart, you know, so I didn't just learn how to run Google campaigns. I learned, you know, how to build websites and use Photoshop and sell and use analytics. And I think the more diverse your skill set, the A, the easier it is to be kind of your own boss because you don't yeah. have to rely yeah. on someone else. And then B, it's easier to sell those things to other people. And so I think the more diverse your skill set is, the more freedom you know you can ultimately create for yourself. And I love that because I think one of the mantras we hear so often right now is that you should niche down, you should be a specialist, you should be hyper, hyper focused. And I think there is a space and place for that. And it's the right model for some people, but it's not the right model for everyone. I can relate to your story and being more of a generalist where you have a lot of knowledge in a lot of areas. And because of that, you're able to maximize that to your full potential and to leverage that as um, the knowledge where you can come in and be a better advocate for your customers or your clients or the people you're working with because of the knowledge set that's beyond what maybe a specialist would hyper-focus on uh, and do. So tell us a little bit about for you, why you found that general kind of philosophy versus the niche down specialist to be freedom for you. Yeah. So I think a lot of it comes down to creating an insurance policy for yourself. And okay. so I know that if, you know, everything goes to crap, I could, <laughs> you know, be, be a website designer, for example. Right. Uh, or I could go and work as a Google ad campaign manager, or I yeah. could go be a sales guy. And I think it's important to clarify that I, I do think it's important to niche down, but I think it's it's poor to specialize. Okay. And so you yeah. should, um, you know, I always talk to people and they're like, oh, well, you know, I'm not the salesperson. Uh, you know, I don't know how to sell, but you know, selling is useful no matter what your career is. Yeah, and actually sure. the better you are at selling a, it's going to be easier to probably get a raise. It's going to be easier to get a new job. It's going to be, uh, easier to, launch your own side hustle, whatever it may be. And so I always encourage people to create diverse skill sets and especially complementary skill sets. So okay. if you're a good coder, learn how to sell. If okay. you're good at design, learn the analytics side. You know, if you're good at, uh, you know, front end website design, learn to the back end. Yeah. And so, you know, so you, so you don't have to rely on other people. I never wanted to have to rely on outsourcing something, you know, yeah. I've saved, you know, I've built all of millennial money myself and everything from, you know, the logo to, uh, you know, the design to the images, all those things. And, you know, I've saved probably tens, if not, you know, many tens of thousands of dollars because I was right. you know, able to do it myself. And so also as an insurance policy, one day I might 
be, hey, you know, I want to get deeper into graphic design and start doing some of that work for some people. Actually, a lot of the best graphic designers that I know have never studied it in school. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so for me, it's an insurance policy in the future as well, because, you know, I could go out if 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 all all went to crap and, and find a job, you know, doing one of those things that I know already know how to do. Yeah, completely. And as a person that's owned a digital agency doing web design and development, it's amazing how uh, there are those people who excel. Um, and yet on our team, there were those people that were very stagnant about their gifts and their, 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 their skill sets. And it was always those people defined by curiosity. Like maybe they were really good at what they were doing, but they were curious to become better or they're curious to learn more. And I see that same trait in you, that you're a constant curious learner, that you're, you enjoy that process. For some people, they may go, well, I, I just do this as a job. How can they start finding things that, that feed their curiosity in those places that they may feel stuck in their job and really expand and become more of a, a, a well-rounded or a multifaceted uh, individual in the, the role that they're playing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think a lot of you're right. I am a very curious person. I've always been a curious person. That's just, you know, part of my personality. I think a lot of recommendations need to be put through that personality lens yeah. because there are people out there. They're just, they're just not that curious. You know, they want to go to the, their job and they want to come home and, you know, they want to play their video games or go out and sit in their hammock. And that's cool too. You know, you don't always need, you know, there's, there's, you don't always need to be hustling. You don't always need to be learning. Some people don't like podcasts. Um, one of the simplest ways just for me, it was just starting to watch a few YouTube videos. Yeah. I think, you know, the barrier to entry to learning anything is just so low now because someone's made a YouTube video on it or a lot of people have. And so for me, even when I started coding, when I started learning JavaScript, uh, it was from a simple, you know, YouTube tutorial that I was like, oh, that's actually easier than I thought. <laughs> I think right, a lot right. of people think things are a lot more complicated um, and when you just watch a couple videos, you're like, oh, you know, that, that's all you need for the taste. Yeah. You know, it's just yeah. like I, I watched a, 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 you know, a JavaScript video and I was like, oh, this is easier than I thought. And I'm interested in it. Yeah. And I learned that in about 20 minutes. Yeah. You know, I didn't have to sign up for a ten thousand dollar course or go back to school. And so, you, you know, you can you can kind of test those things on your own. Yeah. Um, I also really encourage people you know, to think about what they really love in their life and then ask, you know, what skill could I, you know, create or what skill do I have in order to, to, you know, get more closely involved in that thing. And what I mean by that is, you know, there was a reader of mine who's, you know, super into micro brews and like, you know, made his own beer. And he was like, oh man, I'd love to work in the beer industry. And I was like, well, you know, what are some things you could do in the beer industry? And he started researching it and, you know, came up with this idea that he could do, you know, branding and packaging design for the, you know, beer and spirits industry. And funny enough, you know, a couple months later, he reached out to me. He's like, hey, I got a job in an agency and now I'm on, you know, the Miller Coors account. And so he's making, <laughs> you know, he's working, you know, in, in, in some different capacity. He's, wow. he's now working in the industry, you know, that, that he's interested in. And that's just because, you know, he started, you know, looking at the skills that he had and his hobbies and, and looking for connections between the two. And so I encourage people to do that, um, that as well. I think that's great insight because I think so often uh, we think that there's a right way to learn this stuff or to become an expert in this space or find an, a way, an avenue into the, the industry like this gentleman you were talking about who was able to get into uh, the beer industry in a, in a unique way that I think a lot of people would have written off as not the right way. What I hear you saying over and over again is throw out kind of the perceived ways of doing it right and be creative in that process of learning and evolving your skill sets, evolving uh, what's possible and getting past the roadblocks of we often as a society put in our way, uh, just go around them in a different and a unique and creative way. Yeah, there really aren't any rules. 
Like I think, you know, the older I've gotten and the more I've done in my life, you realize that a lot of the boundaries and limits that you think exist, they, they really don't, Wow. you know, they're, they're just set there and they're perpetuated by certain people and you can get around them. Yeah. Um, and in fact, a majority of the jobs in 10, 20 years, they haven't even been created yet. Wow. So what an incredible opportunity, you know, to go out and try and create new things and, you know, one of the things I never wanted to be was dependent upon, you know, someone else for, for my job. Yeah. You know, I yeah. think so many people, it's like if they lose their job, you know, they've got a couple months saved and they're just like, you know, they need to get another job. It's like, right. Oh, I can't afford to not have a job. Right. And it's just, it's never been easier to put yourself in a position where, um, you know, you really don't have to rely on, you know, someone else to, to, to pay you a wage or, you know, you can give yourself more options. And so if, you know, your job is crappy or you want to try something else, you, you have that freedom to do so. And that's the thing is my book, Financial Freedom is, is sure financial independence is one level, but even just having, you know, three or four months of expenses saved so you can hop to another job or if you lose your job, you know, everything doesn't fall apart. You know, that's financial freedom too. Yeah. So, so good. You mentioned at the beginning of the interview that you um, love teaching. You love giving people the resources to learn this stuff. For you, how are you finding purpose in what you do? Yeah, I think it's all purpose-driven work. Um, it's interesting because I, uh, I, I'm, I'm motivated, as I mentioned, with you know, with such a different goal, you know, I want to reach and teach people that don't have access to this information. And one of the ways, you know, even writing the book, you know, a lot of people don't listen to podcasts or they yeah. don't read yeah. blogs. So it's like, how can you reach someone that maybe, maybe their parent or grandparent will buy them a book or, or their teacher will buy them a book and they'll sit down and, you know, I know if they can read, you know, if they read these first like three pages, I can hook them, yeah. you know, it's like, here's how to become a millionaire by 30. You know, you right. can, you can get a lot of people interested yeah. in money by telling them they could become a millionaire by 30. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of the, a lot of my work, um, I'm trying to kind of bring a level of meaning and mindfulness to money mm -hmm. that I don't see represented in right. the mainstream. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the finance industry sells a level of precision that in a lot of ways is not only unrealistic, I think it's counterproductive. Okay. It's like, how do you even begin to think about how much money you need to save for the rest of your life when, you know, we're always growing, we're always changing. I mean, I'm a radically different person at 33 than I was at 24 when I started my financial independence journey. So how would I even begin to save for that future me? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people aren't kind of given permission to grow. Yeah. You know, they're not given permission to take calculated risks. And I think a lot of, you know, at least the finance industry and a lot of what's written about money, you know, is a really kind of black and white perspective that, you know, at the end of the day, money is a reflection of who you are. Yeah. And the more you can master money, you know, the more you can really kind of master yourself. Yeah. And yeah. I want to bring my goal, my ultimate kind of, personal goal is if in 10 years, you know, more people are talking about that other side of the coin, which mm -hmm. is life and meaning and purpose, as opposed to, you know, let's try to make more money because, because they're, they're hand in hand, you know, you right. can't, you can't really have one without the other. And I think that's why a lot of people, to be honest, are, are really unhappy. Just how they define success is based on a number or based on a job title or based on a career when in reality it should be based on the type of life you're living. Right. It's about defining the lifestyle you want and then building a, a means to that lifestyle around the end goal. Yeah. And knowing what's enough. Yeah. You know, and knowing when you can say like, cool, like, you know, I I've got it really, really good right now. Yeah. And you know, I, I want more of this. Yeah. I don't need necessarily more money. And that's something, you know, I even have struggled with in my own life over time um, just because, you know, I spent so much time making money and I still enjoy making money. 
um, that sometimes I have to check myself and be <laughs> like, hey, you know, don't do that. That's not in service of the mission. Right. Um, but right. I'm starting to get better at it. So cool. You just shared a little bit about a big goal that you have for the next five, 10 years. What's one challenge that you're currently working to overcome in your business and what you're growing? Yeah, I think my biggest challenge is burnout. Okay. Um, I definitely, I'm a really intense person. Uh, you know, I always, you know, I, I kind of see a clear path, you know, for this mission and for this journey. And, you know, we live in this, you know, 24, seven, 365 yeah. world yeah. where, you know, you can always create, you can always record another podcast. You can always tweak a blog post. You can always reach out to someone. And I think for me, you know, just knowing when to stop and actually stopping and putting yeah. limits around, like I just moved to New York city right. and for this book launch and I'm entering kind of this next phase. And, you know, I've, I've put in place an actual schedule where I'm going to try to stop working, you know, at 6 PM every mm day. Um, and I've never done that right. like in my entire life. And I'm actually quite scared about it because, um, you know, there's, I just have a high propensity for burnout. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, you know, that's one of the risks just with me and with a lot of people, uh, especially when you've got your own thing going on, you know, that you could, you know, there's always more that can be done, but, you know, at the end of the day, not only rest, but, you know, it's important to make sure that, you know, you can try to balance or at least make balance a goal. Super, super cool. We'll be back with Grant Sabatier and going deeper into this whole financial freedom philosophy and and what a new generation of, of thinking around money can really bring to us all. In season two, episode 64, our guest was MC Miller. He is the founder and CEO of Opportunity in China. If you haven't checked out the episode, make sure you check it out. Super cool. And here's a little bit more about today's sponsor, Opportunity in China, and what they're doing. At the dawn of the 19th century, forward-thinking people moved to the commercial centers of Europe. Moving into the 20th century, America welcomed millions into the land of freedom and opportunity. It is now the 21st century. Many of the successes and fortunes of our generations will be made in China. To learn how you can seize opportunity in China, follow the Opportunity in China podcast. The Opportunity in China podcast is available anywhere podcasts are streamed, or you can visit our website at opportunityinchina.com. Now let's rejoin our conversation with today's guest, Grant Sabatier. We are back with Grant. He is the man behind Millennial Money. Uh, you were sharing about your transition from Chicago to New York right before we jumped into our finished up last segment. I was listening to a podcast episode. It was the um, uh, Millennial Money Minutes with Matt uh, Zubricki. Is that right? Yep. All right. And he and you were talking about your transition from Chicago to New York. I think often when we see experts, when we see people who are uh, the, the, the people we look up to, the people that we uh, think of as, as the experts, we put them on a pedestal of perfection. But one of the cool things about the episode I was listening to was you were talking about your move to New York City and how you were looking back on the place you had bought in Chicago, and now you're looking at it as maybe a bad investment. I think often when we see these um, amazing people who are thought leaders, like yourself, we think that they have everything perfected. Tell us a little bit about how failure has helped define your successes. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm human. We're all human. Uh, I think um, first anyone that kind of calls themselves an expert, I don't think they're really an expert. <laughs> I've never tried to call myself an expert in any way. You know, right, I'm just right. another human, you know, orbiting, orbiting the, you know, the sun like everyone else. Um, you know, I just try to share my experience and my perspective and, you know, hope hope it helps you know, someone, someone on their own journey, 
Um, I think one of the things I've always tried to do since the beginning of Millennial Money is just be very open and vulnerable about where I do struggle. Um, you know, whether it's I do write a lot about burnout, I do yeah. write a lot about early on, I made a lot of stupid decisions around money. Um, even during the Millennial Money, like the first year, uh, you know, I, I struggled with lifestyle inflation myself. Mm. Um, you know, my what spending. What does that mean, lifestyle inflation? Yeah. Um, so I lived really consistently at like the 45 to $50,000 expense level, okay. uh, you know, while I was going through financial, you know, my financial independence journey. But once I reached it, I actually spent over $200,000 the year after I became financially independent. Wow. Um, for a number of reasons, I also just went kind of out of control. You know, I think I was pretty repressed in some sense. And so lifestyle inflation is simply the idea that, you know, as you make more money, you spend more money. Right. And, you know, it can, it's the one reason why, you know, so many people that make a hundred thousand dollars or more, they have nothing saved. Right. You know, the simple idea is you just kind of make it, then you spend it. Right. Um, and so I struggled with that, you know, pretty intensely for a year, you know, I talked about the burnouts. I talked about, you know, even now, um, you know, there are some poor decisions that I make with money. Uh, you know, you mentioned that example of my property in Chicago. Um, you know, I, I think I made a pretty good real estate investment. Right. I don't think in hindsight it was a great one. Um, that property is still on the market. I'm paying four thousand dollars a month for it to sit there with no one in it right wow, now which wow. feels terrible <laughs> um you know and then the same thing too is you know i think our you know relationship with money it's an ongoing relationship right. and you know for me my attitudes around it you know just continue to evolve and you know to actually um you know i i, I managed my money so intensely when i was you know chasing financial independence, um, that since then, you know, I, I don't think about money as much anymore. And so there are times when I could certainly be more diligent with my own investing mm. or more diligent with my own cash flow management. Uh, yeah, but, but it's one of those areas I literally used to spend five minutes every day, uh, at least, you know, tracking my finances and monitoring my money. And I definitely have slacked from that over time, um, just because I have other, other things occupying my time. But, you know, to your point, um, you know, I think it's really important, especially for anyone writing about money or, uh, you know, ideally to, to share, you know, some of their challenges as well, just because, you know, what you see online and these people who've made it, you know, th th they're struggling too. We're all, we're all struggling. Yeah. Very, very few people um, you know, have it all completely figured out. Right. I, I would go a step further and say that anyone who thinks that they have it all figured out is yeah, setting exactly. them up for <laughs> setting themselves up for a really bad, bad experience for sure. You, That's probably true. You uh, are researching and studying and writing on your blog about so many different areas of investing. There, you know, of course, is your traditional investments, 401ks and stock market, mutual funds and bonds and even life insurance uh, mechanisms and tools to use. You also write a lot about real estate and house uh, hacking and how to use that as an investment. For somebody that's new into the world of investing and and managing money it seems like a daunting and overwhelming experience to figure out and i think for a lot of them they're looking at it and they go well my job it has a 401k so i just do that because it's easy and i don't have to figure it out or they may go and say i have done well with the business that i've started or with the job i work at and so i've gone out and gotten an investment banker to manage my money for me. What are some investment tips for the everyday Joe or Jane who's out there listening and just going, ah, I want to do this. I want to have more control. I want to have more understanding of what's going on, but I don't know where to start. What are some things that they need to do? Yeah, I think there's a simple, uh, a few simple tips. The first is, you know, there's long-term investing and then there's short-term investing. Okay. Uh, and there's two different strategies. Um, 
for short-term investing, any money that you're going to need in five years or less, you should invest it in a very conservative way. That's just because, you know, you don't want the stock market down 30% when you want to take the money out to buy a house. Right, right. Um, I think short-term money, some people, in my opinion, are a little bit too conservative, um, with their short-term investments, uh, you know, they just leave it in cash in a savings account and then yeah. they actually lose money to inflation. Right. Um, so, you know, a simple thing you can do is buy a certificate of deposit or you could put it in a bond, a bond fund or even, you know, putting it into like a Roth IRA, um, and knowing that, you know, if, if an emergency happens, you could always take out your Roth contributions without penalty, but we don't have to get into that complexity. <laughs> um, the, the simple idea is that any money you're going to need in the next five years, you know, put it somewhere where you can get it, where it's not going to drop a lot in value. Yeah. yeah. Um, any money that you're going to need after that five years plus uh, should be invested in the stock market. Okay. hundred percent. Uh, uh -huh. okay. stock market and real estate. Um, those are the two by far most dependable, um, you know, asset classes, uh, out there. And, you know, when you're investing in the stock market, investing in long-term, uh, you know, index funds, so total stock market index funds, which is basically just, you're buying an ETF, mm -hmm. which tracks the entire stock market. So, 99.9% .9 of investors should have their money, uh, long-term money in a total stock market index fund. Um, you can take a little bit of the long-term money and put it into individual stocks. I typically don't recommend more than 5 to 10% of your net worth in individual stocks just because so many different things can happen to that individual company. Um, and then really from you know the other asset class, real estate, uh, you know, buying your home, ideally, if you can buy a two or three bedroom and rent out the other rooms, just to offset the cost of your mortgage, or in some cases, completely cover the cost of your mortgage. That's what house hacking is. Okay. Um, Which works a for a single person, but maybe not for a family or something like that. This would be more of a younger philosophy on that with renting out rooms and stuff. Uh, Oh, dude, it works for anyone. Okay. Um, so even if you're in a couple, uh, you know, renting out another room to another couple or to an, maybe an older person, um, or even if you have a family, you know, if you've got, you know, a basement apart, you know, you could, you could turn your house, you could turn the basement into a basement apartment and rent it out to, you know, someone locally, um, you know, who, you know, maybe it's an older person, maybe it's, you know, someone who's, you know, you know, maybe it's someone who helps out, but, you know, thinking creatively about how to use the real estate that you do have just to offset the cost of your mortgage. A lot of people own houses that are bigger than they need, right. or, you know, they could certainly get creative just to, you know, even 500 to a thousand dollars a month coming from your property to reduce the cost of your mortgage. That's, that's, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars you can invest you can invest somewhere else. Super, super cool. One of the other things you talk a lot about is side hustles and entrepreneurship as a tool for financial freedom. How can people who, uh, entrepreneurship seems like such an overwhelming thing. I've done it, of course. I, I've ran a couple businesses and uh, even for us seasoned people, sometimes it's overwhelming when we're in it. Uh, you mentioned side hustle. Let's start there. Why is that a good tool and how can people find the right side hustle for them? Yeah. So side hustling is just the simple idea of making money outside your full-time job. Right. Um, you know, but you it's can not do necessarily a part-time job. It is kind of like your no. own thing. Yeah, it's totally its own thing. And I think a lot of people think about it wrong. Okay. I think, uh, you know, it's fine to go drive for Uber or walk dogs on the side and make <laughs> a little extra money. Right. But a lot of people just side hustle to spend. Okay. You know, they're like, oh, I'm making $200 extra this week. I'm going to go out and spend it. Um, I think you should side hustle to invest. Okay. You know, you want to maximize the growth potential of that extra money that you're making. Right. Um, and then the second thing, a lot of people, you know, they side hustle for someone else yeah. and so yeah. um you know walking a dog for a dog walking company you know you're going to be getting you know 50 percent of what you know the dog walk actually costs you're not getting most of the money and so thinking about side hustling as an opportunity to kind of test being an entrepreneur and so 
come up with a couple ideas, start doing them, see how they feel, see how much money you make, see if you enjoy it and use it as a way to become your own boss and kind of a limited capacity and see if you like it and see what you enjoy doing. A lot of people are more entrepreneurial than they realize. Um, you know, they just haven't taken that step to test it out. And then on the flip side, a lot of the most successful entrepreneurs, you know, they're, they're initiatives, you know, their companies started as a side hustle. And so there's an opportunity where you could start doing something you really enjoy on the side. Uh, and then, you know, it takes off or you, you know, start making money doing it and you, you could actually turn it into, um, you know, a lifestyle business. And then you don't have to work, uh, work again. You know, you see this all the time now in the blogging world. A lot of people are starting blogs and they're starting to make money blogging and they're writing about something they enjoy. And then, you know, in a couple of years, that blog's making pretty good money and all of a sudden they're making more money than their full-time job. And then, you know, in a couple of years, they've transitioned their side hustle into their full-time gig, ultimately opening up a lot more freedom. And so side hustling for more freedom really only works if a you invest the money and b you know you try to do it so you're your own boss um the you know there's the paradox in the gig economy that you know if you're <laughs> working for tax ta you know task rabbit or instacart or uber or lyft yeah, yeah. you know that you're in control of your own time but you're not there's still you're still having to trade hours of your life for money right and so to really side hustle um and maximize its potential. You know, you want to get in the in the area where you're not having to trade as much money for your for you know as much time for your money. Super, super, super cool. I agree a hundred percent with that. Um, and and side hustling doesn't have to be. You know, we use the word hustle, but it doesn't have to be a, a drag to do that or a burden to do it. A lot of times, you can use it to supplement your job in places that you're passionate so that you're getting fulfillment from even your side hustle where you might not from your traditional job. But it's amazing how often that people who are truly investing the time and energy to create that side hustle where it turns into their full-time gig, it turns into something that is sustainable. And that's a powerful thing that I think most people, uh, they think that they have to have it figured out and the answer is when they start and go, oh, if it's not just you know, making me a million dollars at day one, then I'm not going to invest it into it. But I think starting out small, starting out as just that simple entry opens up a lot of doors for down the road. Yeah. And you can learn new skills. You can, you know, meet new people. It can right. open new opportunities. It might, it's just going to take it. It might take a very different form, Yeah, but a lot of people, you're right. They just sit on the couch, you know, they, they watch Netflix and, you know, they don't take kind of that first step, but it's really that first step that it's not about even the hundred extra dollars you're making. It's about all the things that you're learning and just, you know, all the ways that you're growing. I mean, on the flip side though, you know, being an entrepreneur can be incredibly difficult also. Absolutely. And so I try to be open and transparent just about the challenges there, just because, man, you know, you've been there. It sounds like yeah, it's, it's yeah. not, not always, not always easy. It's yeah. also you know, it requires a very, um, you know, just requires some grit and, you know, being able to, you know, a lot of, I think would be really good entrepreneurs quit too early. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Uh, you, uh, one of the other resources that you talk a lot about is best money management, best money tools. Can you give us maybe your top three? Uh, in terms of best money tools, the first one is you should always be tracking your net worth. Okay. Um, that's the scorecard in, in personal finance. A lot of people think, oh, I'm making a hundred thousand dollars, but it doesn't really matter how much money you're making or even necessarily how much money you're saving. What matters is, is your net worth growing and your net worth is simply your assets minus your liabilities, your assets being anything that you could sell for money things like, you know, your house or your, you know, vinyl collection or any, anything that you could, could actually sell and get money. And then your liabilities or your debt, um, student loan debt, credit card debt, personal debt, mortgages, all those things. And when you subtract 
the liabilities or your debt from, you know, the things that you have of value, you know, a lot of people are surprised that, you know, their net worth might be zero or it might be negative, even when they're making a hundred thousand dollars or more. Yeah, yeah. And you really want to focus on that net worth. And there's a number of different tools, you know, mint personal capital or two of my favorites, you know, it's just, you plug them into your bank, you plug your bank accounts into them, you know, they're both free and you're able to, you know, track your net worth, which is, is really kind of the most important number. Um, that I think is, is by far the best money tool. Um, I am actually kind of anti-budget myself. Okay. And so you have a lot of people that track or try to track every thing that they're spending. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that a lot of budgets reinforce a scarcity mindset. Um, I think a lot of things like, you know, the latte or the glass of wine or the manicure or whatever you're spending your little dollars on, you know, those aren't <laughs> the things that actually are holding you back. Um, and so I don't think you really have to even track them that intensely. I think a lot of, you know, budgets keep people from managing their money. Really all that matters is, you know, reducing your housing, transportation and food costs. You know, a vast majority of Americans spend 70 to 80 percent of their money on those three things, you know, so move to a smaller apartment or buy a smaller house or, you know, rent out one of your other rooms. Anything that you can do to reduce your housing costs, you're going to get a lot more savings there than, uh, you know, trying to cut back on like the really small things. Same thing with transportation. You know, if you need a car, buy a used car. Um, if you don't need a car, definitely don't buy one. The average American spends over $10,000 on their car per year Yeah, and food, you know, you can eat out, just don't go crazy. And those are really kind of the three key areas where if you can keep those in check, you're going to save a lot more money than cutting back anything small. There are a lot of investing tools out there now too. Acorn, uh, Robin hood. There's a lot of those tools out there. Do you have any one of those that you really recommend? See, Acorn or Digit, those are two good ones. Um, those are just bonuses in my mind. Um, a lot of people who use those tools, they think that that's enough. Okay. Um, in my opinion, you know, saving your extra change, sure, it's better than nothing, but it's really not going to move the needle over the long term. Uh, and so don't kind of kid yourself that saving extra change or rounding up your purchases is going to add up to how much money you're going to need for the future. Um, those are, those are bonuses in my opinion. Um, the same thing with like a Robin hood, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, you know, or at least I don't recommend investing much money into individual stocks. And so, you know, that's kind of counter to obviously, you know, free trading. If you do want to buy a stock, you know, Robin hood's fine, but a lot of people, you know, they're taking, they only have maybe five, ten thousand $10,000 and they're putting it into a single stock in Robin Hood and they're looking to double their money or get rich quick. And that's, <laughs> that's really kind of the wrong way to think right. about both short and long-term investing. Yeah. Um, you know, that's more gambling than anything else. Um, if you do, you know, you, you mentioned this earlier, if you do kind of think you need a financial advisor, you want to work with a financial advisor, um, the best way to do it is to, you know, work with like Vanguard's personal advisor service or, oh, okay. um, you know, that, that's a good one where, you know, they, they take a very small percentage of your assets under management, mm -hmm. um, but you get access to really good advice and good tools. Um, you know, Betterment's another okay one, but in a vast majority of cases, you should try to manage your money yourself and you should really, um, educate yourself so that you can do that. You know, it's not nearly as complicated as, you know, as most people think it is. You have a book that is in pre-order right now. Tell us about that book. Oh man. Oof. <laughs> Toughest thing I've ever done. Uh, so the book is uh, called financial freedom, a proven path to right. all the money you will ever need. You can check out financial freedom book dot com uh, to learn all about it. Uh, the book is the simple answer to the question, hey, Grant, how did you do all this? Mm. Um, you know, I've written about 300,000 words on the blog since it <laughs> launched, right, but yeah. you, can only, you can only say so much in a blog post. Uh, you really can. And so I literally, 
you know, stripped everything down and created a path um, that's that's really customizable. No matter where you are, kind of in your own financial journey, uh, you know, you're going to be able to get value from the book, uh, and it's meant for you to walk through it once a year. Okay. And so it's something where as your relationship with money changes and grows, yeah. you know, you can read it again and not only see more and learn more, but it's going to help you get to that next level of financial freedom. Um, it really uh, is is all about trying to get you to the point where, you know, y- you have enough money invested that you can live off that money for the rest of your life. You know, that's the ultimate goal, financial independence. But, you know, there's really seven levels of financial freedom in the book. And, you know, the key is to, you know, how can you get to each level as quickly as possible? Because, you know, once you get to each level, you know, you not only have more options, but you should have less stress amount around money yeah. and yeah. more freedom to make choices uh, ultimately to live the life that you want to live, uh, which, which at the end of the day is the goal. So it's, a, you know, everything from how much money do you need to, you know, how much money do you actually need to live a life you love to, you know, I have, you know, 11 different ways to think about money in the book, you know, every wow. time you make a purchasing decision and then I get into the good stuff, you know, how to make more money. There's a whole side hustle framework in the book, oh, cool. uh, step-by-step that you can follow to, to go from idea to profit uh, in five weeks. And then, you know, there's the investing piece as well. And then finally, you know, how, how do you use your full-time job as a launching pad mm. um, as opposed to just something that maybe even if you do like it, you know, you might not be taking and making the, you know, the most of it. You also with There's that. There's a lot in there. There's yeah. a lot in there. Yeah. It sounds incredible. <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to checking it out myself. You also are launching a podcast as part of this too. Tell us about that. Yeah, the Financial Freedom Podcast. So uh, you can just go to financialfreedompodcast.com. Yeah, I wanted to, you know, I'm I'm a huge fan of podcasting. I actually like podcasting more than I do blogging. Oh, wow. Uh, And, you know, I just like the open-ended conversation format. I really enjoyed doing Millennial Money Minutes uh, with Matt. You know, it was like personal finance in five minutes or less. Uh, We did over 280 episodes. And we're going to be doing those a little bit less frequently. Just we kind of burned ourselves out. Yeah, yeah, Um, yeah. And so I've always wanted my own kind of longer format show where I could talk as much about money as I could about how to live a meaningful life. Mm. And so the episodes, the goal is that every other episode, one will be focused on money and how to reach financial independence. And the other will be focused on something deeper. Um, So the third episode is, you know, how to leverage fear. Uh, where I talk about with this guy who's uh, just an incredible guy, Ash K. Nanavati, who is like an ultra marathon or ultra athlete. He used to, you know, be the guy who walked in front of the convoys for the Marines wow, and, wow. you know, hunted the IEDs and how, how he used fear in his own life. Um, you know, I'm going to do a whole episode on like meditation. I'm going to do a whole episode on um, you know, just, just mindfulness and just finding people who can talk about money, but who can also talk about that other side of, you know, how can you use money to, to live a more meaningful life? So I'm going to try to find that intersection of the two. Mm-hmm. And then for people who like the book, you know, they can go deeper. Um, yeah, yeah. The book features 12 different other people who reached financial independence by 35 and I've done episodes with all of them as well. So they'll, you know, you can, if you're interested in someone's story, you can go deeper on the podcast. And the goal is by the time the book is released, you know, there'll be, you know, 40 or 50 episodes already done. Cool. When's the book come out? So the book comes out in February, first week of February, February 5th. Okay. Um, but, you know, if you go to Financial Freedom Book and you sign up for, uh, you know, the seven day email course or, you know, you sign up for my newsletter, uh, there's going to be about 100 people who get the book a month before it comes out. Oh, cool. And then, you know, I'm giving away thousands and thousands of copies. Um, so for people, you know, who are interested, one of the things uh, for the first 5,000 copies that are sold, I'm actually buying 5,000 copies and giving them away wow. uh, to schools. And so one of the things I might actually do that for every book sold, I'm trying to figure out uh, the logistics of that. Yeah, but yeah, super cool. How can people find you and connect more with you? 
Yeah. So best way is millennialmoney.com. You can just search for millennial money on Google uh, and I'll be that first result. Um, that's a good way. You can reach out to me there at millennial money on Twitter, um, financial freedom book to learn more about the book. Um, I do a lot of connecting on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, so you can connect with me there through millennial money. Hard for me to keep up with email. <laughs> I'm at the, I'm at the 700 oh, email a day yeah. limit now. Yeah. Um, and so don't recommend you email me cause you might not hear from me. Um, <laughs> but the best way is through, through millennial money. Someone monitors that contact form. And then I do check uh, tweets and direct messages uh, pretty frequently as well. Super, super cool. We'll be back with Grant and rapid fire questions in a moment. Jumbo think is all about helping you take your dreams and ideas and making them a reality. One of the ways we do that is through this podcast, but another way that we do it is through the free guide you can download at jumblethink.com slash guide. We just launched a new guide, The Dreamer's Method to Micro Experiments. This guide will give you an easy method to actually doing micro experiments to break that big idea into small steps so you can make your dreams and ideas a reality. Swing on over to jumblethink.com slash guide to download your free guides and learn more. Now let's jump into rapid fire questions with Grant Sabatier. And we're back for rapid fire questions. Grant, are you ready? Let's do it. All right. First question is, what is one tip you'd give someone with a big idea or dream and they don't know where to start? Start writing about it. 100% start writing about it. Just get a blog up or start writing on someone else's blog. Maybe write a guest post. Start oh, cool. connecting with people who also have a similar passion for that idea. What is one change you'd like to see in the world? Uh, people defining success for themselves, I think, was is one. You know, I think people would be a lot happier, you know, if they created their own version of success as opposed to trying to map their lives onto the common definition. We're, we're evolving our rapid fire questions. And one of the new things that we're doing um, is asking this question, how do you define success? So for you, how do you define it? Yeah, that's one of the things I only recently, I think, <laughs> figured out. Uh, to me, success is peace. Okay. Um, it actually money money just you know helps me get there, but it's really about having a peaceful life that I love. Super super cool. What do you want your legacy to be? Oh man, that's a deep question. Yeah. I, I actually have never thought about that. Oh, okay. Uh, but I will right now quickly. Um, <laughs> I think if I'm viewed as you know helping, you know, someone, you know, someone looks back and maybe I helped them make a little extra money or I helped them, you know, take an extra risk in their life. Um, you know, I've already gotten quite a few emails from readers who have helped mm. do that. And that yeah. was uh, inspiring. And I just want to be able to continue to do that. Where do you find your inspiration? Buddhism. Okay. Uh, right. I am a Buddhist and I do a lot of meditation and a lot of seeking there. Mm -hmm. I also do a lot of reading. Um, but I find that kind of the greatest growth, at least in my own life is coming from within. What is one book that you think every dreamer or entrepreneur should read and why? Blue Ocean Strategy. Oh, um, okay. Is my favorite one of my top five favorite books of all time. Um, the simple idea of how do you compete? Uh, you know, so many people just do the same things mm -hmm. as other people. Yeah. And I think there's a lot to be said uh, and a lot to be explored to try to find your own blue ocean. So you should definitely check it out. Super cool. I, I It kind of caught me off guard because, you know, after doing 160 plus episodes with guests, that is uh, a book that has never come up. So it just kind of caught me off there that's that's awesome i love it have you read it i have not oh uh, man so you I'm need to read to it, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> what is one habit you find helpful in your life as an entrepreneur uh meditation is a good one uh one of the things the more i was able to let go and mm -hmm. learn to let go yeah. and not care as much about the outcome and care is not the right word but just you know not be as so attached to the outcome mm -hmm. i think the more successful i've become how do you start and finish your day? Uh, always start the day with coffee, walking my dog. I'm not a morning person at all, uh, despite trying to be. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, I usually finish uh, the evening uh, kind of 
decompressing in some way, whether it's, you know, having a glass of wine, chatting with my wife, reading a book, um, used to watch TV. Don't really anymore. Um, didn't even bring my TV to New York city. Wow. And so, yeah, that's how I end my day. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, what do you think you'd be doing? Um, probably writing fiction. Okay. That was one of the things I yeah. always wanted to do and might still do at some point. Um, you know, that that's, I love telling stories. And so telling stories in some capacity. What is one dream you're still wanting to fulfill in your own life? Um, I always wanted to own a diner. Okay. Like one of those small town diners. Yeah. I know it's like pretty hard to do now that I live in New York, but <laughs> I, I'd love to own a community meeting place somewhere. Oh, cool. um, I've only ever lived in cities in my okay. life. I grew up in a city, went to school in a city, now live in a city. And so living somewhere that's a little bit more small town and just being able to support kind of a community meeting places is, is one of my goals. Super, super cool. As we wrap up today's episode, we always like to leave our guests have a final thought. So what's your final thought for us and our listeners today? Be grateful for what you already have. Um, if you make over $30,000, you're already in the top 1% in the world. Mm -hmm. And a vast majority of people live on less than $2,000 a year. You know, wow. if you're listening wow. to this, you already have so much. And just don't forget about that. You know, I think we make a lot of sacrifices for money um, and just other, you know, a lot of sacrifices for it that, you know, might, we might not make or, or, you know, might be out of context. And so just, you know, be grateful for what you already do have because it is so much more than most. Love that. Grant, thank you so much for taking time out and talking about a topic that we simply ignore or don't talk about enough. So thank you for your wisdom. Thanks for taking the risk years ago and going on this journey so that you could show the way for the rest of us. Hey, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Once again, we want to thank today's guest, Grant Sabatier, for taking time out and sharing his story. Make sure you check out his new book and connect up with him. Later this month, we are jumping into a new exciting journey called The B-Side, where we bring on some people for Facebook Lives and then also publish them as podcast episodes and on YouTube. Make sure you swing on over to facebook.com slash jumblethink. Let's become friends and you'll be able to catch the next live broadcast of the B-Side. As we wrap up today's episode, I want to encourage you, do not do this journey alone. If you have a big idea and dream and you're ready to make the leap, make sure you're bringing in your friends, your family members, your coaches and mentors, colleagues to help you along on the journey. When you have friends, when you have other people along for the journey, it is so much more sustainable. You'll be able to enjoy the journey. You'll have help along the way. And if you need some help, if you want somebody there for the journey, the JumbleThink team would love to be a partner with you. Swing on over to jumblethink.com slash help me to learn how we can help you on the journey of chasing big ideas and changing the world around you. Until next time, get out there, dream big, and change the world around you. Les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois, lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.